thank you. Thank you very much. And thanks, everyone, for coming in, in this difficult day or wet day. And thanks for having me. Um, the introduction there has basically outlined who I am and where I'm working. And just to say that I um, specialize in the sociology of the family. And I did my PhD in Trinity. I did a master's and PhD in Trinity. And I finished there at the end of 2010. And those two studies that um, Darren mentioned were there where I conducted during my time at Trinity. The first was, um, I mean, this is the, the, the data from which I'll be speaking to uh, in the studies. Basically, over the last 10 years, I've been researching, writing, and reading about divorce and separation and changing family relationships, both in Ireland and in other contexts. And I've been involved in these two main studies. And the first one was um, under the, the kind of supervision and the guidance of Dr. Evelyn Mahan, which was a study of the, fam um, the, the contact arrangements and made at the family law courts. So that was an observation study sitting into the family law courts back in 2000 and conducted in 2007 or 8 and then written up in 2011 or published in 2011. And the second study is a longitudinal qualitative study, um, which was the exploration of the social reality of separation and divorce. So after the court, what happens in the day to day lives of people who are separating and divorcing? And that, um, as I said, longitudinal qualitative study included a sample of 40 separation or divorce. I'll use those terms interchangeably, uh, and I know there's a very distinct difference. But um, the, the, the sample itself included, included a mix of both separating and divorced parents. And I, I, I emphasize the word parents. Um, and there was 40 of them, 10 of which were marital dyads, i.e. they were, you know, couples. And I spoke to the ex-husband and the ex-wife. And um, the sample also included a, a 10 family lawyers. And then in 2014, when I was thinking about um, writing much of this up in, you know, I'd written several articles and I was thinking about bringing all the material together, I decided to go back and speak to the parents um, and see how things were going six years after I had spoken to them, but actually about 10 years after most of them had actually separated or divorced. So that was in last uh, August, September, I think it was, in 2014. So the first round of interviews mainly comprises, you know, the data from my PhD. Uh, and then the following, as I said, years and time I spent um, just, just thinking about what the data was telling me in terms of the gendered experiences of separation and, and, and divorce and the different parental role battles that take place, the different forms of power and coercion that are used at the time of ending the marriage and then going forward into negotiating life post-separation. And uh, and then the divorce legislation itself, how I would argue it was highly, well, many would argue that it was highly restrictive for certain political reasons and for a whole range of reasons, and how it was set out that specific way, and how that had very specific impact on fathers in particular in negotiating a space for them in 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 fathering and, and developing a father-child relationship when when things were very uncertain for a very long period of time before they could get their lives regulated. Okay, so you're all, I saw the article myself in the Irish Times on Tuesday, and I was like, oh yeah, I forgot, it's 20 years now since divorce legislation came in. And back in the 80s and mid 90s, many of you will be, you know, might have been around and might have been lobbying and been part of this, um, these campaigns. But at the time, as you're probably all aware, you know, divorce was depicted as, it was as, was depicted as something that would challenge the stability and continuity of Irish families. It would tear apart the fabric of Irish society. And as one of the last countries to legalize divorce, the Irish context, the legal context specifically, never mind the socio-cultural context, is fairly unique. At a time when most Western countries had been enjoying divorce or, you know, having divorce legalized for at least 20 to 30 years or longer, over just over half the population at the time believed it was time to remove the ban. So we are a context, and we're a very interesting, particularly European context or northern um, context, for looking at how family life has is, is being regulated by, divo by divorce, or sorry, by the state, um, and using divorce as a lens to see how the state is regulating our personal lives. Now, looking back over the last 20-year period, a lot has happened. There's been a huge... Uh, the, the social climate in, in, in Ireland has significantly changed. We've had a boom and a bust. 
and the role of women continues to change as more women move into employment. There continues to be a decline in the influence of the Catholic Church on family values, or has there, and we've even legalized same-sex marriage. So over that 20-year period, when some people were, in my sample in particular, were actually divorcing fairly early on in that period, like 1997, 98, 99, compared to people who were only separating later in 2008, the, the sample includes a range of people who have very d distinct and different um, experiences of divorce. So that's what I'm looking to do. I'm, so divorce, as it was depicted during that period, and even over the uh, la uh, following 10 to 15 years, you know, implicated endings. Divorce does implicate endings, dissolution, termination of relationships. Yet most individuals, as Doran had pointed out that I argue, you know, most individuals and families remain deeply connected long after they separate, long after they divorce. And so the argument I put forward and what I tried to do in the manuscript is demonstrate how divorced parents remain connected and committed to family life through a range of practices, but not just practices, but through emotions which are experienced in specific socio-cultural and economic environments. Now, as Darren also pointed out, much of the socio-legal or sociological research undertaken over the last 30 years on divorce hasn't really captured the the emotional work and the real experience, the, so the emotional experience of um, of separation and divorce. So I argue that understanding the emotion work as well as instrumental tasks undertaken by divorced parents is critical for understanding the commitment and connectedness parents continue to have to past and present relationships as they blend these forms of relationships into each other, even 10 years following separation. Okay, I've outlined the data on which I'll be drawing from and, and how the study has kind of come to the manuscript, what the, the data the manuscript is based on. Um, I just want to speak a, a briefly about, you know, um, the debates that the manuscript engages with, the important broader theoretical preoccupations and debates about the nature of relationships in contemporary society. So, as I said, I will be asking, you know, what are the knotty and fundamental issues that these theories that I've outlined here, or concepts, raise in contemporary society, and how does exploring them through a focus on the divorce families throw light on them and debates about them? So divorce families offer, I argue, a lens into exploring contemporary social change and social life. The nature of commitment, the form of conflict, and the sense of unpredictability characterizes patterns of interactions which are experienced in contemporary social relationships. Changing family relationships and life are linked to other changes in the social world. So in the stories that the people told me and the accounts that they gave of the post-separated life are stories of autonomy, stories of ongoing commitment, stories of, of, of deep embeddedness in relationships that are subject, however, to the changing developments and circumstances of the broader socio-economic context, such as relocation, migration, employment and unemployment, ill health, care and financial insecurity. So people, the parents that are, you know, the participants spoke about how they experienced divorce as one of a multitude of, cha of cha daily challenges over this particular 10-year period. Secondly, I want to also look at specifically um, the gendered as aspects of separating and divorce, and so especially post-separated parenting. Although women and men go through much that is the same when they divorce, they also have very different experiences that are distinct to their gender. What are the differences in women's, I ask the question, what are the differences in women's and men's experience of personal relationships and their ability to shape the negotiations and influence them and to negotiate at the end of the marriage? What form of power, what forms of power do we observe? at the end of the marriage and in negotiating life into post-separation. And some of these, uh, these findings I'll outline now shortly. I'll also ask what way, ways do family laws shape the nature of commitment post-divorce? There's a lot of um, debate and, and questions about uh, whether a no-fault divorce system made things too easy. Did it you know, facilitate family breakdown? Did it ease family breakdown? Uh, and it did it kind of lend itself or legitimize a trend for towards greater individualism in personal relationships. Now, the sociolo sociology of the family and sociology more broadly has neglected the expressive and emotional aspects that are key elements of everyday family practices and social structures. So I draw upon key theorists in the area, such as Barbellet, Kemper, Sayer, Burkett, and Hochschild's work, specifically, to, to, to look at and argue how emotional responses are 
influenced by culture and social factors. It tells us a lot about what is going on in the context, how people are experiencing separation and divorce. It tells us something about the link between social structure, personal choices, and value systems. And much of, the, of what I'll talk about today will focus on that. So I'll present the findings by describing post-separated fam family practices and, and emotions undertaken by four distinct groups of divorced parents that were identified in the study. And these I've named as follows. We've got the egal egalitarians, whose emotional experience and motion work involves feelings of guilt and shame. And we have the dependents, who I call the dependents, uh, who live between, that should be actually fear and freedom, sorry, that's a mistake there. And then we have the deserted wives, excluded fathers, and everyday unhappiness. And what's interesting about this work is how, um, what's important about this work is showing the mess, not just the messiness of family life, but actually the kind of toxic aspect of family life, even when people are no longer living under the same roof, or when they also live under the same roof, albeit separately and apart. So following that, I'll, I'll talk about the distressed couples. Now, they're the marital dyads that I sp um, spoke about earlier. So they're a, a bunch, a subsample as such, where I looked at and spoke to both the ex-husband and wife. Um, uh, and they endure everyday conflict. And I'll speak about the sampling approach for that particular subsample, which is an important aspect of the story. And finally, having gone through those four different sets of approaches to post-separated family life, um, I'll look at the kind of how things change over time. So I'll be looking at divorce and the temporal aspects of divorce. So these particular distinct groups differ um, along several issues, some mainly to do with the age of the parents and the age of the children, the times of separation, a whole range of factors, <coughs> but most specifically, actually, the type of co-parenting arrangement and, um, and kind of contact arrangement that they embarked upon following the separation. The experience of divorce amongst these parents also evokes similar emotions and emotion works, emotion work. So I would like to spend most of the time just speaking about the actual findings, and so I'll jump into it, basically. So first of all, we have the egalitarians. Now, I have included some of the kind of the narrative and the actual voices of the participants where possible, um, and you'll hear some of these now shortly. So I'll only draw upon um, quotes just to highlight what I'm talking about. So the egalitarians um, share equally their parenting and their time with their children. They're the 50-50 you know, parents. The children either spend a week on, week off um, with either parent, or they kind of separate the week, split the week in half. And they do so continually up 10 years following separation. Now, at the time I spoke to them in 2008, they mainly had young children, anywhere, any child kind of under 10 for example. Um, the group of five mothers and one father represent a very significant group of parents as they indicate the changes that are taking place in family practices. The egalitarians during the marriage were part of dual income um, professional households mainly, and they adopt a non-gendered egalitarian approach to the reconstruction of family practices when faced, when, when faced with the separation. So what, if you can picture it, you know, they set up two households of equal value. The two sets of income coming into each of those households of relatively equal value. The, I should say from the outset, this is a very fairly middle class affluent sample, which would, you know, be the majority often of people who actually go through a divorce. Uh, not the majority, but a, a sizable sum um, who can afford it. So they do have the resources to pull upon, and the, many of the women specifically spoke about that. But they work to get those resources, and I'll explain what that means shortly. So they maintain a kind of an intact household um, setup that by sharing parenting um, equally, but they undertake considerable emotion work in doing so. They, they, um, they regularly resolve conflicting duties towards themselves and their children by, by undertaking s significant sacrifices. Now, the parents talked about a range of sacrifices. So many of the women in particular who I spoke to talked about having to put up with married life for much longer than they desired in order to obtain, in order to accumulate the resources they would like to set up two equally sized and types of households following the separation. So they, as I said, they, you know, they, they all had fairly long marriages, 15 years or longer. But many of those years, the final years of that marriage, were, were sacrificed 
to enable a situation where the children could move between two houses of equal size, value, and kind of in the same location. I should I should mention that many of these parents were separating um, in the early period of 2000s. So you know between 2002, three, four, and five. So but really before the kind of bust and during the boom kind of time. So many of them, for example, household assets had accumulated significantly since the time they had purchased them, maybe back in the late 80s. Um, the sacrifices they, they undertook were understood as practices of commitment to sustaining family life. Other parents spoke about not going back to court after separation um, just in, if, um, before divorce when they knew that one parent had financially benefit at the cost of the other. So as I said, most of them separated you know, just before the, 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 the economic recession. Then they, was, they were seeking divorces during the economic recession. At that time, many, parent, many parents who had, let's say, during, at the time of separation had uh, agreed to pay off the other person for their share in the household, well, their, I'm sorry, their share in the house, that house now was, had devalued hugely. And so they felt like they had lost out. They felt they had, they had financially lost out. Now that might change over the next five years again. But at the time I spoke to them in 2014, they were willing to let go of those, that kind of, that, um, they weren't going to revisit that agreement as things were working out smoothly. And, if, and for the sake of the kids, they were happy to let things go. They also spent considerable time together. They often had dinners twice a week together. They went on holidays, some of them went on holidays together with their former partners. You know, many of them spoke, we're not actually that much different to a married couple. So they spoke to each other, they made decisions together. They were very much a united team in terms of parenting. But that didn't mean that they actually always enjoyed such being, you know, having this united family life. So some of the mothers spoke about, you know, the, the ill feeling of having to sit and have this dinner for the, you know, for the sake of the kids, but actually not really enjoying it. At the, in 2014, the parents enjoy a happier, better quality of life than which, according to them, which, you know, um, than that existed in their marriages. But they were not free from a shadow of guilt and shame. I argue that the egalitarians developed their own range of practices of doing post-separated family life, which defend their moral worth as a good parent, a good divorcing parent, um, as they negotiate and experience feelings of guilt and shame. So making considerable sacrifices is a way of resolving conflicting duties towards themselves and their children. Now, when we look about, when we think about guilt, and you know, this might have a Catholic, a specific Catholic Irish story behind it, but the egalitarians feel a deep sense of deep, deep sense of guilt that they acted immorally by separating from their husbands and breaking up the family. The feeling of guilt is the feeling of an unpleasant and self-evaluative emotional reaction to having violated a moral imperative or social standard. So says Vangelistian Sprague from 1998. Hochschild describe guilt as a name for seeing ourselves as the author of an unw unwanted event. The egalitarians, despite their efforts in maintaining joint parenting, two households of the same value, and generally, you know, a joint approach to family life, have deep feelings of guilt. Unfortunately, I don't have the sound clip for this particular, or I don't have it available here today, and I'm not going to read the entire thing. But this is a, this is a quote from one of the participants, Sandra, I call her. Now, Sandra is a professional, um, and she's professional in many ways of her life. And she talked not only in 2008 about the feelings of guilt at length, but she also talked about 2014, returned to those feelings of guilt. Now, I didn't specifically ask them at either time during our interviews and our conversations. Now, Sandra outlined why she feels guilty. And I've just, if I, I'll just emphasize what's underlined here. She says, well, she feels guilty because she's putting in the short term her own interests ahead of theirs, the children, and ideally, it would be better for them to be brought up by two parents together than in a different location. She also feels guilty because she hasn't, she feels like she hasn't handled it as well as she might have with her husband specifically. But then later she says, I have to get out of the marriage. And she continues to say, I'm guilty on a lot of fronts, really. So she feels bad towards, you know, sorry for her children. She feels sorry for her, towards her husband. She feels guilty towards him. But she has to remind herself, and this is in 2000, this is, this quote comes from 2008. She has to remind herself daily that actually she's not that bad. Now, when I spoke to Sandra in 2014, she had overcome a very serious, um, um, health, 
scare. And she'd been hospitalized for several months. Now, during that period, her ex-husband hadn't necessarily shown her the support that he, she would have liked, but she did expect that support to be shown. Now, she still feels um, this, this, that, that she is prioritizing her own interests. Now, why does she feel that? Hochschild argues that there's framing rules that govern how we feel. So like if we go to a party, we should be happy. If we're at a funeral, we should be sad. There are specific ways to feel at specific events or experience. And I argue that within this group of, 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 um, of parents, there are specific framing rules governing how they feel. The first one is that parents should prioritize, always prioritize their children's interests. Egalitarians talked visibly upset about the abiding conflict between fulfilling their own desires to leave the marriage a marriage that wasn't abusive, a marriage that wasn't, you know, um, wasn't, would have been seen as very functional from the outside, but was not so satisfying their understanding of what a good marriage or a good intimate relationship should be. So they spoke about how their parents, for example, wouldn't understand why they got divorced. You know, they actually didn't um, go into detail with their parents about when they explained that they were um, separating. Now, going back, that was the first framing room. Sayer wrote that guilt is related to specific failures, either real or imagined, in the treatment of others as opposed to failures of the self. So in the case of the egalitarians, the parents feel guilty towards their children for breaking up the family. That might seem obvious. They feel guilty for prioritizing their own needs. Sandra feels guilty for not handling the relationship with her husband better, and she feels guilty about the reason she ended the re relationship. The guilt is aroused only by awareness of moral failings in relation to others. The good mother ideal is evoked as she reminds the listener that she doesn't ordinarily put her own interests ahead of her child's. In this instance, Sandra experiences shame, actually, rather than guilt, as she feels she acted in a way that belies one's status, as not having met an idealized self-image of a good mother. We are reminded, in Sandra's word, that emotions are not something that are just felt, but something that divorcees do, an object to be managed. And the second framing rule governing the type of emotions that get evoked at a time of divorce is the belief that divorced families are broken families. Now, this sociocultural belief that prevails in our society is not actually, um, um, basically means that parents feel ashamed about breaking up the nuclear family, despite their unhappiness with family life. The implication is that a parent will feel shameful about leaving a nuclear family, even when they feel positive about, about it. And they feel like it would be better for the children if they had a normal family life. Now, the third framing rule governing the type of emotions that get evoked for this particular group of parents was that children will be negatively impacted. Now, we see this in the newspapers. We see this, you know, the general legal and media discourse around separation and divorce is that children will be negatively impacted. And much of the scholarly work shows that some children, certain circumstances, will be negatively affected or maladjusted, as some of the uh, terms are used. But... This particular group framed their opening like, experiences and narratives, both in 2008 and 2014, as, and these are a particular group who are, you know, should be applauded for how they are approaching post-separated family life. They frame as, well, I don't think the children are that affected, really. And then they go into detail about how each of them are going to university and how each of them are now getting jobs and setting up their own independent households, etc., etc. But they still turn back to this constant belief that they should be affected. And this is what I argue, you know, despite the joint approach to parenting and despite managing fluidity across these two households, they still believe that there is this, this chance and still likely to come, even though most of the children at this stage are kind of young adults, that they'll be affected by the separation. The majority of children with divorced parents enjoy average or better social and emotional adjustment as young adults. Booth and Amato, Harrington and Kelly, Kelly and Emery, much of the research in the early 2000s has shown us this. But this is not the message the parents believe. The egalitarians expected their children to fare worse as they'd broken up the family. So the strong sense of guilt and shame are feelings created due to societal norms about what a good mother particularly is, what a good parent and family does, and what divorced parents endure to defend the moral worth. Now the next group, the dependents, who are living between fear and freedom, this group of 11 parents uh, continue to be dependent on their former spouses 12, you know, up to 10 years after separation. So contact in this group was not 50-50 like the egalitarians, but included at least one, um, one weekday overnight and a weekend overnight, usually kind of every second weekend. 
Now, the difference in this group is that during the marriage, these households were kind of one and a half income type households. So usually there was a, pri a primary carer, and the primary carer was predominantly the mother in most of these households. Now, what happens in, these, in this particular group is after a period of very unsettled access and financial disputes, um, things begin to settle down a little bit more. Parents stick rigidly to a, a contact arrangement, but no flexibility. I should mention, that, sorry, that the egalitarians did not turn to the courts. I mean, eventually they had to turn to the courts just to get a divorce order, but the whole negotiations were done through mediation. The dependents, that didn't happen in their case. They cling to the law as a lifeline, as one or two of the fathers mentioned. Did they have tried mediation at all? Some of them will. Yes, yeah, some of them will. Most of the parents actually, over the whole sample, had tried mediation at some point. Um, and I'll explain actually what happens in some of those instances. So that in this group, the parents continue to be heavily involved in the day-to-day -day lives of each other, even 10 years later, and are expected to put up with a great deal from their former spouse. Leaving the marriage does not allow them to escape these problems, and they find reasonable ways of living with unreasonable people around them, so they see it. But in doing this, they strive to find a balance between sustaining a sense of family life and achieve, achieving autonomy and setting up new families, um, and second, uh, blended families. The parents are resentful over the failings of the partner who they are dependent on, while at the same time fearful of the consequences of their actions. I'll explain what this means in detail now. So they, they live, particularly in the first five years post-separation, in this hostile, dependent state, where, the, um, where they are threatened by the power of each other. So uncertain housing conditions or arrangements, uncertain child and financial arrangements, generate fear during this extended period of uncertainty. Fathers fear losing out um, on their father-child relationships and their place in the family. Mothers are fearful of the anguish children or the perceived anguish that children experience during this period. And they're also fearful of the financial costs of the separation or where they will be living when, you know, finally they do get separated. While male power and patriarchal authority is exerted through the withdrawal of financial support, not complete withdrawal, but maybe the kind of... Um, postponement of, of financial support, female power is practiced through maternal gatekeeping practices. Both forms of power are regulated by the state through contemporary divorce laws, some with more, more and more weight than others. During disputes over access to the children or maintenance, hope arrives through the legal system. And it's, the, it's this way that the parents can assert their control over their role in the family. Both parents in this period are highly vulnerable. Mothers, as part-time er earners and primary carers, can be trapped economically and ideologically. And they show how fathers, as involved parents and primary providers, can be constrained in their desire to be more involved. So the emotion of fear was experienced by all mothers and fathers in this group, but they were articulated with different degrees of strength. So when we're fearful, we are usually fearful of losing out on something we cherish, because some other human or, bo or body is blocking our goals. So what's interesting here that this particular group of fathers in this group, in this group, this is a bunch of fathers and mothers. Unlike previous reports that indicate men are fleeing from commitment, and you know, in this particular group, fathers are getting involved in caregiving and exclusive caregiving, i.e., you know, one-on-one -on -one caregiving with their with the child, in a context in which they are outside of the fam of the marital home, at least and trying to carve out a space for themselves and improve the quality of the father-child relationship. Now, other scholars, and myself included, have outlined how this fear of losing contact with the child leads many separated fathers to realize where their interests lie. That's a bit loaded, but... Um, their fears express vulnerability in a relationship. They therefore change and try to become more involved, uh, and become more involved. It is for this reason that the fear has special relevance to the understanding of changing practices of fathering both in Ireland and in the UK context, as evidence shows. Now, the first framing rule governing the, the feelings um, in this particular instance is... I should actually, before I say that, is I should... No, I'll go into it now. The first framing rule governing the feeling is that you should feel good about the father wanting more parental involvement. You know, the law is pushing shared parenting, joint parenting. And much of the research is kind of... is contradictory on this front. Carl Smart's work talked about how, you know, pushing joint parenting in every instance may overlook the kind of the, the perspective of the child of being shared on a weekly basis or a monthly basis or whatever it might be. 
So the feeling rule that they should be happy for mothers, that fathers, are, that the mothers feel that they should be happy, that fathers are seeking increased involvement, did not align with how they actually felt. The mothers queried the father's approach to parenting post-separation because they were never really that involved during the marriage. Why suddenly now? And in doing so now, they actually disrespected the role and caring work which took place during the marriage. The mothers in particular were faced with moral dilemmas about being caught between meeting the needs of the child and being fair to the father. They felt that high, this high level of access of moving back and forth during the week, but mostly at weekends, was disruptive for the child. Again, this group have the young children, children under the age of 10. They felt that changing arra arrangements were harmful for stability and the psychological well-being of the child. Now, the other, f the other kind of framing rule in, uh, um, that, that the parents in this group were felt, or that like, was governing their feelings, should I say, is that they, they should feel, that parents should feel free following a separation. Parents in this group were trying to achieve a balance between sustaining family life and autonomy. However, they felt constantly suffocated by the pre presence of a previous partner. Separating and living away from an, an ex-spouse should feel liberating. They should have the freedom to move where they want to, live where they want to, parent how they want to, spend their money how they want to, but they didn't. In this case, there were two or three um, cases of relocation where parents were forbidden or you know prevented from moving away with their child. So the relief that a divorcee feels after leaving a troubled marriage is a feeling that is expected in many cases, expected in many cases, but not achieved for many of the parents in this specific group. This focus on freedom and individual autonomy, you know, that we hear in the media and uh, in other places, has, I argue, has overlooked the relationality of individual lives and how these lives unfold and of the context and condi conditions under which the parents make choices or feel they can make choices. Now, the third group, oh, okay, so I should explain. This is um, a, a, one of the um, experience that Maria, a 40-year-old mother who separated eight years ago, who had, at the, in 2008 had a child who was roughly six and four, and now in 2008, you know, we're still young, uh, middle-aged teenagers. So she talked about how um, her ex-husband got involved in fathering post-separation. So she said, I mean, in the sense, he is actually a much better father since we split up. And this is quite common across the sample, both with the egalitarians as well, but more so with this group. Because he always has a fear about losing contact, or losing the children, if he messes up or slip, slips up. So he did almost always turn up to pick them up, you know, make arrangements. I think he's far more involved since the separation. That remained the case. I mean, I think lots of people look at him and see a very devoted father. So from the outside, and many of the mothers spoke about this, this arrangement looks like, um, you know, the perfect post-separated family arrangement where the children are enjoying contact. However, on the inside, it, it is experienced very differently. Lots of people think he is, a, you know, that um, he has a very high level of contact. He's very close um, with the children. They think he's a great dad because he has done stuff with the kids. At the same time, Maria, this parent, kind of facilitated shared parenting, although she had been the primary care during the marriage, because she felt intimidated by him and afraid of his capacity to twist anything she said. He was very good at stuff, and he could argue with, this, with her very effectively. And I think she, and she was afraid that if he went to talk to someone, so, for example, many of the family, family therapists that write reports or, you know, um, that, that, that they would see something, that they would see the devoted dad side of him, not the other half. Now, that the third group are probably the group of wives and, and fathers that those pictures from the 80s kind of were depicting, this hello, divorce, goodbye, daddy story. And this is a group of parents who are a good bit older, almost seem like a different generation. They're in the mid, in 2008, they were in the mid 50s. So when I spoke to them in 2014, many of them were coming towards being retired or in pensioners. They have, there is limited contact between the children, um, who were in 2014, adult children and the fathers. And the mother is the primary carer. She was the primary carer throughout the marriage. She was the dependent housewife throughout the marriage. And she becomes the primary carer and sole carer following the separation. Now, this particular chapter and this um, the experiences of these parents looks at the everyday unhappiness that the divorced men and women experience 10 years following separation. And it reminds us of just how toxic intimacy can be and how it can be destructive of the self. 
Amongst this group of 11 parents, there are no descriptions of elations or sense of freedom following separation. The relationships continue long after divorce, not only because my men and women are dependent on each other financially or that they share parenting. The relationships also continue as the participants are consumed by the ways in which they, the relationship has shaped their contemporary lives. Contact between the run resident parent and children in this group is limited. Most of it involved a few hours contact once a week, but actually in many cases it was limited to a few meetings a year. The children involved in this group were a lot older at the time of the first round in, uh, of interviews in 2008, and as I said, many of them were adults by 2014. As such, contact wasn't negotiated between the non-resident parent, the non-resident parents. It was negotiated between the non-resident parent and the child directly, and always had been. Contact was not contested in any of these cases. It wouldn't be. It wouldn't be entertained in the courts. What's interesting in this particular uh, group is that in these contexts, patterns of class relationship, I argue, form a backdrop against which particular interactions are played out between mothers and fathers. While class differences between spouses during the marriage are less visible to the outsider, upon divorce, the class divisions are exposed. Mothers in particular, who have been devoted their married lives to caring, suddenly have very different economic prospects following separation. But this may not feel what they need or deserve. The class position of former husbands and wives following separation tell us something about specific class and generational differences in experiences of separation, but also in the experience of work and the value and recognition of such work through by the former partners, but also by the legal system. It tells us something about equality between spouses and mar modern marriages. Recognition is implicit in the way in which our former partners and the law treat and respect the value of care. Respect here was being about seen and treated like you matter. Now, as I said, most of the sample, you know, most of the sample overall are fairly affluent, or very affluent, depending where you're coming from. And deserted wives, and, um, but in addition to talking about financial matters and parenting matters or the lack thereof, what was at the heart of most of the complaints and experiences of deserted wives and excluded fathers is that they did not get the respect they feel they deserved from their former spouse. And this takes place in a context of distinct class and gender inequalities. And I'm going to show you one example here. Hopefully you can hear it, but you can read it if you can't even hear it. So if I do a compare and contrast mm -hmm. with uh, what, as a result of the separation, what I have and what my husband has, I don't know what to call him, but I can't think of things. <laughs> 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 um, uh, I'm here today, um, and we'll begin at about two o'clock. Mm -hmm. um, I can't go out really on, unless I, I've got some cover. I can't go away, uh, etc. Yeah. I can't work full time, mm -hmm. therefore I have no career, therefore I have no pension. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't have that social network, mm -hmm. um, etc. And he has got his career, he's very high earning. Mm -hmm pension, lifestyle, and his new relationship. Mm -hmm. And I have the second relationship since he's separated. So I thought that was my thing. Uh, maybe it's more serious. But that's what he's got. He's got that freedom and I don't. Yeah. You know, yeah. That, that is the you know that that's the that's the crux yeah. of it. I mean nothing there's nothing I can do about that. The only thing I can do uh, I don't want to either. But all I can do here is start putting in, start trying to get my own support systems mm -hmm. in place. Mm -hmm. And I'm in the process of doing it. Okay, that was in 2008. Celine, a primary care who of a dependent adult child. Um, so that's a. Um, when I spoke to her in 2014, I expected things to be slightly different. They were not any different. Um, she said, there is nothing I can do about the, uh, what, her situation. She also spoke in 2014 about there was nothing in that decree, in the divorce decree, that works as a reward system for what she did for all those years and what she continues to do. And she has a dependent adult child, as I mentioned, who will be dependent for their foreseeable future. Um, and that's, that's one perspective of many of the primary carers of, of the mothers. Now, on the fathers on the other side, they had a, a different way of experiencing um, family life post-separation. Actually, before I get on there, I'm just going to explain 
one of the feeling rules, I'll go back, sorry, um, of managing feelings of unhappiness is that, you know, caring is different to and worth less than money making. So many of them are deserted wives. We're not only frustrated at how the marriage was ended, and they were deserted, for want of a better word, but they also feel disrespected by the lack of reward that they receive for the caring work that they undertook in the marriage and long after the marriage and continues today. Um, so the mothers who entered marriage and motherhood, in, they were in the late 70s. They were entering marriage in the late 70s and early 80s in fairly affluent circumstances. And they invested a great deal of energy into care and domesticity and did not necessarily see themselves as inferior as a non-wage earner. It was the cultural norm and marker of good motherhood, protected and upheld in the Constitution. In many respects, not for all, if it wasn't a choice. While the women in the sample were entering marriages in the early 80s, late 70s, early 80s, most of them were leaving marriages in the mid-2000s. So the findings tell us something a great deal about how care is valued in the 21st century. Feelings of disrespect, experience and interaction with the former husbands and the legal system point towards ongoing devaluation of raising children and, and, and the superiority of money-making in marriages. Now, other authors have argued that on the ground where mothers live, the lack of respect and tangible recognition is still part of every mother's experience. The wives in this chapter did not feel, sorry, the wives in this group did not feel or were not treated as equal partners for setting aside their careers, employment opportunities, and becoming homemakers. This tells us something about the ongoing invisibility of care work. Now, What's interesting is how the legal system, you know, approached and how um, the courts approached the remuneration of care following the separation. So wives were received kind of compensatory packages. They were awarded by the court. Um, and the limitations therein were, were made quite explicit by, or made quite, um, the women were quite aware of. So there were certain utterances and advice from solicitors and, and, and legal representatives that allow us to see the value of, of, of care more explicitly. So one solicitor told uh, a, a dependent mother or a primary care, she, told, she was told that there wasn't a judge in Ireland who would give me any pension, anything on his private pension. Not a judge will award you that. Now, as I said, these, situ these, these the circumstances, and despite... Um, legislation that is supposed to put women back in the, the lifestyle which they were accustomed to during the marriage. This was not always the case in, amongst this particular sample. Um, and what about the everyday unhappiness of fathers in this particular, it, the excluded fathers? Now, these particular fathers are, in, from their perspective, excluded. The f I came to know these fathers through, in this research not as the men from Fathers for Justice, who used public stunts and protests to gain attention for fathers' rights. The men I came to know seemed vulnerable due to several tensions. Because of the demands of their professional careers, they didn't put many hours in parenting during the marriage. And as a result, they weren't the primary care during the marriage, and they most certainly weren't the primary care post-separation. But was that their choice? Obviously, the fathers were constrained by the norms and practices in their careers they entered and in the life household arrangements they made. The anxiety of, of the different fathers, but this one father, Joseph, in particular, kind of brings their sense of loss and connectedness to the fore. The excluded fathers felt deeply connected to children and related to the children in different ways. But these relationships weren't sustained by the adult children themselves, which leads us to question whether these were what Wallace Stein ca uh, characterizes as phantom relationships. So let's just listen to what Joseph has to say. for the children now mm -hmm. about that then almost like in the form of letters you know mm -hmm. you even read a bit of verse and, and keep them and maybe send the arm up here and there but keep them almost like they'll be coming into a book of its own mm -hmm. I don't have to deal with them the material you know mm -hmm. I still have to do with that actually it's quite good because I would dream about them regularly I dream about the events that are kind of like one does, yeah. imprinted on your brain, like a, a key moment that you can remember, like you do it all the time, you know. Mm -hmm. And I can I sort of put that down in a way for the future, for the future. Mm -hmm. uh, how do you express it otherwise? You know? mm -hmm. that in the future, that, you know, that, you know. Yeah. Okay, really. 
Now, Joseph, together with the other excluded, who I'm calling excluded fathers, believe that they are excluded through what we might know as parental alienation syndrome. Having said that, most of their children are, even at the time of 2008, were older than, let's say, 13 or 14 years old. So the courts were not entertaining, you know, applications for contact. The, the courts were allowing the children to decide how they would have a relationship with their fathers. And in, in all of these cases, and there's only four cases, so I won't make any claims, but in these cases, the children were not having, you know, were retaining kind of contact for a range <coughs> of reasons. But what these experiences do tell us is the different ways in which fathers try to sustain, sustain family relationships through dreams, through diary entries, through texts, through letters. And it demonstrates ways of relating when located outside of the family for a very different generation compared to the, you know, the egalitarians and the dependents. So failure to recognize these forms of relating prevents us from seeing the balance in caring work that happens and also the balance in parenting that can, can happen post-separation. Now, as I said, I'm tentative to make any strong claims about the excluded fathers in this group, given the size of the sample. But it's evident is that the fathers, you know, um, but there were, that they were not, they the fathers do not seem that they were recognized or respected by their former partners. They have highly conflicted relationships with their ex-wives, and they failed to consider how the relationship with their children during the marriage was deeply connected to the relationship with their former wife. Uh, what I'm trying to say here is that fathers aren't able to build a kind of dyadic relationship, a one-on-one -on -one relationship with their almost adult children following the separation. And that's something to, to think about. Are, are they mm -hmm. fathers angry? Or, no. or are they fatalistic about it? They're deeply upset. It's not, it's not, you know, it's not anger. It, it might have been anger had I caught them in the, within the first year following separation. But when I speak to them in 2008, they're two years post-separation, and when I spoke to them to, in two of them in 2014, they were so deeply upset, and they were still trying to maintain contact, but they still had no, virtually no contact. So they're kind of resigned to this? They're resigned to this. There's a loss of normalcy, you know, there's a loss of selfhood, there's a loss of, just a deep loss, sense of loss. But it makes them deeply unhappy. The final group are the dyads, the most complicated and messy of the, of the sample, in the sense of hearing two stories of the same divorce, you know, um, makes things more interesting, interesting, not just because of triangulation, but, you know, every, every, every relationship has many sides. And in setting out, you know, the research, I should explain how these particular couples were recruited. So these were couples came from a recognized family therapist who writes a lot of reports for the family law courts, um, advising how the court, or recommending, should I say, what the court should do in relation to how the parents should have contact, which parents should have contact, how often with a specific younger child, let's say a child under 10. So all of these parents were attending a family therapist. So in some many respects, they are probably the most extreme cases as they cannot negotiate or arrange with, with themselves. But what's interesting about them is that neither of them want to walk away. So they're not the fathers for justice necessarily. I'm not saying that the fathers for justice fathers are walking away, but they they remain deeply resilient, and they are trying to ensure that they re retain contact, and they do retain a high level of contact. So similar to the egalitarians in many respects, in terms of the level of contact, but the level there is in virtually no communication. There's a high level of legal involvement. Most <coughs> communication takes place through legal, law, you know, legal letters, uh, or this family therapist. Um, but they are very, they're a bunch of professionals. They're dual income households and they have the resources to continue this kind of practices of going to family therapists and, you know, afford, affording all of these kind of services. So the contact arrangements are complicated and involve multiple changes, changeovers each week. As one parent noted, you would need a counter and stopwatch to know what child is supposed to be where at what time. Contact arrangements are court ordered. And both parents are involved in parenting the child. However, unlike the egalitarians, as I said, they're, you know, they're deeply distressed and they don't co-parent. They may have equal time with the child, but they do not engage with each other in any form of, 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 of communication. Now, the parents, ex what I do with this chapter is I talk about uh, everyday conflict, which stems from seeking revenge. And the story starts with why, why might one feel hard done by? So what happens here 
is that one person feels that the, they, that the marriage shouldn't end and they're deeply distressed that the marriage has ended and they embark upon a series of forms of revenge and retaliation that bind the two parents together even 10 years after separation. So the process shapes the relationship. Thankfulness, as I argue, is concerned with restoring their them to their rightful place, having been shamed at the way in which the marriage ended. Um, and since only victims seem entitled to revenge, it is essential to claim this mantle of victim before seeking revenge. And they do so in talking to me, and they do so in, in how they present their stories. What happens is when revenge is sought, and when someone attempts to get even, conflict escalates. And revenge is directed at a specific target with the intent of doing them harm, because they, you believe that they've intentionally done you harm. So I draw upon Barblet's explanation of different phases in the development of vengefulness in presenting this relational account of the development of vengefulness and how it directs action. So, for example, fa family therapy was a site of power, site of conflict, where spouses felt they could publicly vent their anger at each other with little consequence. It was a, a, a space to be heard. Following ongoing problems with access arrangements, parents were urged to attend family therapy as a way of reaching a consensus. But none of them gained a consensus through family therapy. What they gained through family therapy was a way of getting back and then shaming the other parent. So they were pushing, many of the fathers in this group were pushing for family therapy. Two fathers were still pushing for it, 10 years post-separation. And this is when their children were 16, 15, 16, 17. So on the whole, mothers found these sessions of little use and most experienced it as an attack or a whole hour of abuse towards me and my family, as one particular woman said. Now, I'm going to give you a little taste of this. As one particular parent, Alan, who has four children, but and the conflict was about the contact arrangements for the youngest child, who in 2008 was, you know, 11 years old. And in 2014, he explains how he's feeling, or, you know, how things are going. Possibly frustration, anger, anger, um, Feeling that um, I seem to be carrying this very dysfunctional kind of connection that doesn't relate for a very long time. So it's kind of like um, there's a monkey on my back that I've been carrying for a very long time, and you're trying to, say, mm, you know, and you're trying to feel well, and then you're trying to not ignore yeah. the, you know, this must have some impact on you. Mm -hmm. But you can find some way of dealing with it. But then, you know, so. Um, now there's a lot more I could say about that specific um, group, but both parents are trying to seek a moral victory over each other's, and they're just trying to show how they were hard done by and wrongly, um, wrongly um, placed outside of the marriage and on the side of, of, of the kind of parent-child relationship specifically. The findings in this chapter really reveal um, that family life and divorce family life involve less visible forms of demor de demoralizing and intimate. What happens here is a lot of public shaming. So any attack on a previous partner is a public attack. So it can involve things like writing letters to your in-laws, writing letters to the employers of your, in of your former spouse, of a, a, an attack, a physical, not attack, but a physical um, kind of encounter on outside of your family home where the police are called, an allegation of abuse that is not heard in court. It could be a borrowing order or a protection order that doesn't get, you know, seen through in the courts. And there's all these forms or allegations or forms of kind of public shaming that take place that continue. So one form of attack leads to the other person retaliating, and this goes on continually. Families, the wider families, are deeply involved. So instead of maybe, you know, um, they're involved in, in, in siding with their, their offspring and supporting their kind of um, attack on their previous spouse. Now, I just want to move on to the, one of the last points that I'll make. The experience and process of divorce have significant temporal aspects. And in mapping out changes over a 10-year period, I focus on time in three specific ways. Firstly, in the chapter, I look at how I look at contact time. I look at uh, what, I, what I mean by that. I mean, I consider the practices of parent-child interaction, both mother-child and father-child, and the, basically the time parents spend with children. 
Secondly, I look at a specific cultural time when normative changes in parenting and family practices are taking place. And in doing so, I discuss how the findings reveal an increase in parental involvement and family fluidity, but the ongoing gendered responsibility of care. And the third way of looking at time, I look at questions of socioeconomic time and the period in which these group of parents experience divorce process. These issues move from kind of the inward, you know, day-to-day -day, um, negotiations of contact outward, and they move through broader cultural and normative questions to the wider themes of the socioeconomic context. So when I met the parents in 2014, most had repartnered, many had remarried, but all of them had felt the brunt of the economic recession. Most parents had also encountered personal shocks, maybe ill health or the loss of a parent. And the divorce became one, as I said earlier, one of many other challenges that they faced on a day-to-day -day level, with some more pain than others. They all felt lucky to have good relationships with their children, apart from the excluded fathers. Um, but the overwhelming majority of, of, of this, the middle-class white sample, should I say, did not m maintain cordial ties with their former spouse. The circumstances under which the parents continued to co-parent altered extensively over this period. And in the kind of chapter in more detail, I highlight how parents of con you know how patterns of contact and co-parenting remain largely unchanged, and demonstrate parents' commitment to each other and to their children and other children as they move into blended family life. So, although some of the aspects of how father-child or parent-child contact changed, i.e., not you know ten years later they weren't as obsessed with having the children stay overnight every night or every second night. It was more about the quality of the relationship. Um, saying that they still maintain the same level of contact, or at least a great deal of contact, both sets of parents. So over time, the commitment to family does not grow or shrink, but it alters. And so the chapter, and this chapter discusses like how this takes shape for the smaller group of parents. Um, in particular, the, uh, I focus firstly on changes. Um, yeah, what, what I argue with regards to changes in contact is that over time, the commitment to contact you know, is negotiated rather than obligatory. And the parents balance their needs against commitment to, you know, the, what their children's need. Parents during this time make choices. Some parents move away. They remarry and they move away to Cork. Or they remarry and they move away to Wicklow. And in doing so, they, w they know that that will impact on how much the time they can spend with their children from their first marriage. And they make choices around how that, you know, the frequency of contact, vis-a-vis, -vis you know, their own sense of, new life, new freedom, new, uh, new building a new family. But as I said, this is done in a context where it's not seen as shirking responsibilities. It's just a sense of measuring how your relationship with your particular child is, is changing, but how the quality of that relationship is, is kind of maintained. The findings demonstrate how fluid family practices become following divorce. One example is one of the mothers I went back to speak to in 2014, started chuckling when I met her. She said, you won't believe it. You know, when you spoke to me in 2008, I was divorced, or just getting divorced, well, divorced. And I was re living with someone else. I divorced him too, and I've just got married again. So she was married a third marriage, what would have been unheard of in Ireland 30 or 40 years ago. And she spoke about how she manages family life, blended family life, where she has several step offspring, you know, children, where she herself has children moving into the house at different days, different times. And she's, you know, um, managing a new relationship and, an old, and old relationships, new in-laws with old in-laws. You know, <laughs> and doing so with, with a great deal of juggling and doing so with a great deal of work. And she can't, she doesn't really enjoy having her stepson in the house because he's a little bit anxious because he didn't want to leave his his mother, he feels, you know, connected to his mother and he's being disrespectful by living in this other house. But she, she works in order to improve that situation. And she talks about that in great detail. So I, what I observed was a, a great deal of fluidity in family practices. Um, and, a, but a great deal in work, uh, in the kind of work, undertaking work in allowing for fluidity to occur. In linking past and present relationships, mothers, you know, parents in particular, carry most of the respons mothers carry most of the responsibility for care, although fathers become more involved compared to how they have been parented during the marriage. So this is the ongoing gendered responsibility of care. Even in cases where adult children had now kind of moved more towards living with the father, 
Mothers who might see the child once a week, fairly adult, like an 18, 17, 18, 19 year old, would still be the parent in charge of making appointments for the dentist, giving and paying for extra grinds or whatever it might be. And um, they just tended to do this as a way of demonstrating their commitment and just being committed, ongoing com um, committed. What was interesting was the ongoing cost of adult children in the current context where adult children are remaining in the home for maybe longer than they might have in the past, who gets to carry that cost? That kind of cost that wasn't necessarily agreed at the time of the separation. Not only that cost, but the cost of extra, you know, of the various austerity measures that were put in place. The various property taxes, for example, that were put in place. Who gets to carry that cost? But what was seen was that that unequal division of labor in terms of mothers being kind of more, still being, carrying more responsibility for care, Whoever was the residential parent at the time in 2008 for that, or 2014 for that adult child were the ones that were carrying that financial responsibility. They weren't running back to the courts in 2014, 10 years later, to get their half of, you know, the tertiary fees for the second degree or for the post, you know, postgraduate degree. Um, what was unexpected and what's interesting, and then, you know, you see this in the media a little bit, was that former spouses are deeply committed to each other at a time of, of loss or a time of personal crisis. Ex-spouses were still listed as the next of kin. So when there was a personal crisis and someone was in hospital, a former spouse would get a phone call and was, you know, the next of kin and carer for that particular ex-husband. Now, they weren't in cases where there was good relations between the former spouses. And either way, the former spouse would would ask the question, should I look up, should I provide care, convalescent care for someone, you know, for a former spouse? And so those, even those thoughts alone, whether they did or didn't is another matter. But the thoughts that they wondered whether they should provide care for that, particularly for the sake of the children, or now adult children, showed the ongoing level of commitment, again, that was taking place. Um, yeah, that's... Sure. So that's basically what I'm saying. That is, that was the final slide here. So what I'm asking, what does this tell all of us? Well, what does it show? What does this all, what does all of this tell us? I argue that the findings point to the ongoing commitment of family life long after separation, not only because parents are connected financially and practically, which has been outlined in the literature, you know, over the last 20 or 30 years, but through this emotional connectedness. The work in renegotiating family practices and um, post-separation and sustaining family life includes emotional work. This research challenges the range of theories, but particularly the individualization thesis by arguing that commitment to parenting and family life is harder to abdicate upon divorce, given the level of connectedness, specifically in a place like Ireland that remains, you know, a highly restrictive divorce regime and a very pro-contact legal society, like many societies in, in, in the North. So the findings can be used to refute the theory that divorce points to the lack of commitment. That was some of the fears back in the 80s and 90s. Okay, okay that was Thank it. Thank you very much.